Tonight, we're gonna to talk about what it takes to live long and prosper. You remember this? A Vulcan salute from Star Trek. It was a hand signal uh, given by Vulcans when they met each other, meaning live long and prosper. Well, if you listen, Jeremiah was not exactly giving Israel the Vulcan salute. He wasn't saying live long and prosper. He was saying just the opposite. In fact, here's more of what he said. Judah's sin is engraved with a steel chisel, a steel chisel with a diamond point, engraved in their granite hearts, engraved on the stone corners of their altars. The evidence against them is plain to see. Sex and religion altars and sacred sex shrines anywhere there's a grove of trees, anywhere there's an available hill. I'll use your mountains as roadside stands for giving away everything you have, and all your things will serve as reparations for your sins all over the country. You'll lose your gift of the land, the inheritance that I gave you. I'll make you slaves of your enemies in a far off and strange land. My anger is hot and blazing and fierce, and no one will put it out. While these verses are not part of the lectionary reading for this week, they provide background essential to help us understand verses 5 through 10. They describe Judah's sin of unfaithfulness in their relationship to God and the consequences they can expect to suffer. The sin of Judah is written with a pen of iron with the point of a diamond. It's engraved on the tablet of their heart. When people of that era wanted to assure the permanence of a message, they engraved it on stone with an iron stylus. An iron stylus with a diamond point was the premier instrument for engraving, making it possible to inscribe the letters deeply and permanently. There are a number of examples in the Old Testament of something being engraved. God commanded Israel to engrave the names of the sons of Israel on 12 stones, one for each of the sons, which meant one for each of the tribes, and to engrave the words holy to Yahweh on a rosette of pure gold. God engraved the law of the on the tablets of the covenant that Moses brought down from Mount Sinai. Remember those tablets? God had to engrave it twice because the first set got broken. In each of those instances, that which was engraved was sacred. It was intended to remind them of the covenant relationship that Israel enjoyed with God. But now that the engraving spells out the sin of Judah, and it is engraved not on, spo on stones, but on the tablets of their hearts, in the innermost part of their being, it is no longer sacred, but profane. We also find that phrase on the tablet of your heart in the book of Proverbs, where God commanded Israel to engrave loyalty and faithfulness and God's commandments on the tablet of your heart. If the people of Judah had God's commandments in their hearts, there would be no need for a record of their sins to be engraved there. Their sin will also be engraved on the horns of your altars. The horns of the altar are the projections on each of the four corners of the altar for burnt offering and the altar for incense. On the Day of Atonement, the priest sprinkles the blood of the sacrificial animals on the horns of the altar, a process by which the sins of the people are forgiven. Adonijah grasped the horns of the altar to escape the wrath of King Solomon. In other words, the symbolism behind the horns of the altar is mercy, forgiveness, refuge. But now the symbolism is reversed. The sin of Judah is engraved on the horns of the altar as a permanent accusation against them. A sure sign that for God, this is serious business. Jeremiah the prophet preached to Israel around 600 BC. It was during some of the nation's most critical times. It included the destruction of Jerusalem, Judah, and the temple, followed by a period of exile. There were many political upheavals in the Near East, and the nations were all at war with one another. 
Assyria was declining and Egypt and Babylon were each trying to dominate the Fertile Crescent. There were many fierce battles, many great cities fell. At the same time, it was a brief period of reform as Josiah tried to restore the faith in Israel. The reform removed many of the cults and practices that had dominated their society. But unfortunately, many resisted the reform and many people continued to worship other gods. Jeremiah was the prophet called to warn God's people not to abandon their faith, to trust that God was still with them. Hank Williams wrote a song that you might remember. The first two stanzas go like this. Your cheating heart will make you weep. You'll cry and cry and try to sleep. But sleep won't come the whole night through. Your cheating heart will tell on you. This was a lot like the refrain Jeremiah kept repeating to the people of Israel. Jeremiah believes that everybody has a cheating heart. He says the heart is devious above all else. It is perverted. Who can understand it? The people had stopped relying on Yahweh, their God. They were depending on schemes and deals and compromises and alliances to protect themselves. Everyone survived with connections, contracts, and lots of insider information. But these just provided them with a false sense of security. They were all man-made arrangements in which people put their trust. Jeremiah warned them that the deals they thought would give them life could only serve them in the short term. In the early 70s, my parents purchased a piece of land just outside early Texas to build their dream home. They were excited, they said, because it had so many trees. But when they took me to see their lot, I was disappointed. It's true there were many light, live oak trees there, but they were these tall, skinny trunks, each with only a few tiny branches. Except down behind the lot, by the creek, there were some trees with broad trunks and larger, longer branches. The root systems of those trees had access to water supplied by a flowing creek, so they were strong and they flourished. The other trees did not have that advantage, and they showed it. But flash forward a few years after my dad had utilized the cheap irrigation water made available through the county. Now all the trees had big trunks and long, sturdy branches. There was a leafy canopy in some places and lots of shade. My dad had created a huge, beautiful lawn with sculptured shrubs and flower beds and a large vegetable garden. What a difference a reliable water source makes. Jeremiah is saying that we need to be like those live oaks along the bank that have a constant supply of water. They develop deep roots and remain stable. Now consider the hearts that trust in God. These hearts are sturdy because they have a continuous connection to the source of water, to the source of life. They flourish, they are fruitful. The heart who trusts in the Lord will be like a tree planted by the waters whose leaf is green. Such a tree can withstorm, withstand all the storms that nature throws against it. Those who trust in the Lord are blessed because their roots are tapped into the stream of life. These are the folks who will live long and prosper. They are not anxious in the year of drought. God can sustain us through anything. We're blessed because we have confidence in God's prevailing presence. And it is in that presence that we put our trust. God is our source. Jeremiah drew on the images of Psalm 1, where the blessed man is the one who delights in God's word, like a tree planted by the rivers of water. He can survive the drought, unlike the unfaithful ones. The psalmist not only compared those to the chaff, but to chaff that the discerning word, spirit, wind drives out of the garden into the judgment. The Israelites had reached a point where they put all their trust in man-made security systems. 
Instead of building walls and shoring up their border security, they depended on their deal making with other countries. Their dealings had become their God. All their energy, their loyalty and resources were directed toward their negotiations and the preservation of agreements which were self-serving and built on fear, not on faith. Jeremiah said that Israel's constant obsession with playing let's make a deal would cause them to dry up and wither away. They were misled, putting their trust in practices that would lead to their downfall. I believe we are always willing to worship God and maintain our faith when we're getting results, when things are going our way, when prayers seem to be answered for, with whatever we ask for. But what about the faithful person who gets COVID and dies? What about those who have uh, changes in their financial situations because of nothing they have done? Those who have heart attacks? whose children move far away, who lose touch with their old friends. To have roots does not mean that you have to make deals with God all the time. To have roots means keeping your faith strong no matter what happens. We strengthen our roots by remaining in dialogue with God every day, not just when we're pinned down in the foxholes of war. We remain strong by grounding ourselves in the word of God every day, not just when we need to look up a quick answer. If we do these things, our connection to the source will be secure. When we hear about the problems in Jeremiah's day, they don't seem so different from our own. Nations in the Mideast are still in conflict. People have turned to terrorism rather than faith. People have less interest in religion, and many have turned to other gods. People are living in fear, becoming defensive, and unable to trust others. I believe we live in an age where trust in God is often associated with winning success, with self-reliance, with money, possessions. We invest our time and energy in those things that will produce results and rewards. And when we get them, we call them blessings. Like when an athlete scores a 10, he says, God has blessed me. When a person wins the lottery, they say, I've been blessed by God. But I wonder, how do the other unblessed competitors feel when winning is everything and only winners are seen to be important? Consider the television program, Survivor. It's all based on winning. The winning comes through a process of manipulating the other participants to ensure that you are the only one who wins. People are hurt and betrayed in the process. Competition rules, not cooperation. Alexander Frazier Tatler, a contemporary of the Founding Fathers wrote in his book, The Decline and Fall of an Athenian Republic, a chilling warning. Titler found that ancient democracies declined when selfishness outpaced community spirit. He wrote, the average age of the world's greatest civilizations has been about 200 years. These nations have progressed through the following sequence, from bondage, to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to selfishness, from selfishness to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, from dependence back to bondage. This observed cycle demonstrates that a society which starts well will not necessarily maintain and end well. The level of a society's status seems to depend upon shared priorities and the ability to determine what is really trustworthy. People need to cultivate a healthy state of personal responsibility and interdependence. When one becomes totally dependent upon himself, or another person, or even a government or an organization, he will soon implode from the burden of using up all his energy and resources just to satisfy his current level of need. 
Such people will waste away because they were never created with the ability to be totally self-sufficient. Like a scrub bush in the desert, they will soon dry up and become parched, barren, fruitless. When Jeremiah said, blessed is the man who trusts in the Lord, he wasn't talking about one person praying only about his own wants and needs, always looking out for number one. Jeremiah was concerned with the whole community of God. Their survival depended on their ability to work together, to maintain strong roots, to be connected to the source, to live lives of faith, not fear. They needed to remain dependent on God and dependable for one another. We are blessed when our lives are constantly tapped into the life-giving nourishment of God's love. We're encouraged by the community of God's faithful people. When that happens, our leaves remain green. Our land remains green, as Jeremiah proclaimed. We never have to worry about drying up and blowing away. God will sustain us. Faith in God will sustain us. No matter what happens, when the heat comes, we have nothing to fear. Jeremiah was preaching to anyone who would listen. Those who took his words to heart made sure that their lives had well-watered roots. Those of you who come to worship and are willing to listen to the prophet's message are now watering your roots. Consequently, you might be like that tree along the creek that can withstand the storms of life. To be blessed by God doesn't mean there will be no storms. There will be storms, and some of them will be almost too much to bear. But you will not have to face them alone. Jeremiah isn't asking us to be superhuman. He's asking us to be ourselves, our best selves as children of God. When we pretend that we are in control and build our world with a shaky root system, we're setting ourselves up for disillusionment and failure. When we trust God above all man-made systems, above our own manipulations, our lives will be blessed, just as Jeremiah said. Blessed are those who trust in the Lord. Live long and prosper in the Lord. Thanks be to God, whose steadfast love endures forever. Amen. Let's pray. Everlasting God, we trust in you. Root all who trust in you by streams of healing water. Release us from the bonds of disease. Free us from the power of evil and turn us from falsehood and illusion, that we may find the blessing of new life in you. Through the spirit and power of Jesus Christ. Amen.